So uh, coming up is the fifth lecture in the six part series. And uh, it's the second one dealing with R and uh, going to be talking about model selection and then analyzing categorical variables in R, contingency tables, um, and then go on from there. Folks, so, uh, so this is the last of my lecture slides. Um, there is a fair amount of uh, um, material here. So this slide I should have showed at the end of uh, last week. Once you have more than one covariate uh, in the model, a continuous variable, uh, you know, graphical representation uh, becomes uh, impossible and uh, the analyses, uh, you know, the various contrasts you can make get, get complicated. So I basically stopped with uh, curve one way, two way. And so we will come back to this after we do logistic regression uh, in terms of multiple linear regression. So you have a continuous outcome variable and you want to uh, uh, relate it to a bunch of uh, variables. So we'll, we'll get back to it. So in the meanwhile, I first, before starting with categorical variables, I want to spend some time talking about um, uh, model selection. So what we have seen is that we took that one uh, study, our New England Journal paper from 30 years ago, that study, and saw that we could analyze uh, some variable we're interested in in a variety of ways. So we could take the change in cholesterol and look at it with one fixed factor diet, or maybe diet in a second fixed factor, sex. And then that could be done with interaction or without interaction. Okay. So then uh, we said, okay, what if instead of TC change, you look at TC study and you can have diet and one continuous factor, TC pre. That's carved one way. And then there you can allow the slopes to vary in the different groups. And the, or you can have another fixed factor besides diet. And then you have carved two way and allow the slopes to vary. And then this now can be done without interaction and the allowing slopes to vary. So you have these, you know, all these ana types of analyses possible. So the question is. How do you choose among all these uh, models? You know, what is the basis for choosing? We use three models for TC change. There was one way and then two way with interaction, two way without interaction, right? And so uh, is there a way for us to choose among these three models? So one thing you can do is you, co you could compare the residual standard errors. And this is displayed in the uh, output. You know, we're not going to go back to that. But you will see if you if you run it or you can see the old slides, the slides from last week, you will see that uh, the residual standard error is reported for each model. And so for the one way, it was 12.39. For the two way with interaction, it was 7.6. And two way without interaction, it was really no different from one way, 12.2. So, uh, so this is the best, clearly. It, you know, this has the smallest residual error. This information is also there uh, in, uh, in a different form by the partial F test. So uh, any CU function that has a model with more than one variable, it tries to do uh, these partial F tests as they're called to compare that model with the, what we call simpler nested models. That is, the models that it compares with are simpler in some way. They have fewer parameters to estimate. And at the same time, they don't involve anything new. They only, we just take this model, two factors with interaction. And so it compares it with same two factors, no interaction. And then it compares it with just one factor, sex, one factor diet. And it gives a p-value for the improvement or lack of improvement uh, in the fit. And so these are, you can see, highly significant. So this says that this model really 
is the best of those three models for disease change. Suppose you had stopped with this model at two factor without interaction, proceed to compare with simpler models. Now, model with interaction is not a simpler model, so it doesn't compare with that. So it just compares with model with just sex or model with just diet. And what you see here is that this is not significant. So a two-factor model without interaction doesn't improve over a single-factor model with just diet. So, so if you're not considering interaction and, and you want to explore this model, the, uh, what a CU2 way says is, you know, you should really go with the simpler model because this is not improving uh, whatever explanation you have for your data better. So the second factor only helps if you allow diet effects to be different between sexes, then it helps. Now, if we now look at this model and we look at the regression coefficients, this is also displayed in the, um, in the CU2A output, you see that uh, um, all these p-values are significant for all the coefficients. So I personally like the model I choose to have not just the smallest residual error, but also all the regression coefficients to be statistically significant. And that is the case here. But not always. This doesn't always happen. A model um, that fits significantly better than any simpler model, it can happen that it doesn't have all its regression coefficients statistically significant. So I don't have a resolution to this dilemma beyond saying this. If the purpose of the analysis is to test hypotheses, that is hypotheses related to um, each of these factors that you have in the model, then the significance of the regression coefficients is quite important. But if the purpose is to come up with the best description of the data, if you're just saying, these are my data and this is the best description that I want to have, then it may be okay to go with the best model, even if some coefficients are not statistically significant. Now, for TC study, this is the other variable we looked at. You could do TC study again with just diet or diet and sex and diet and sex without interaction with a covariate TC pre, allowing the slopes to vary, second factor, and so on you end up with nine possible models for TC study. We didn't do all of them uh, the last lecture, but you can see how you can have all these models. So you can, as before, you can look at the residual error. So you can see the residual error in the very simplest model is quite a bit higher than when you start having the covariate. The covariate clearly helps a lot. TC pre lowers the standard error quite a bit. So clearly, you need TC pre in a model. And then you find that uh, when you also put uh, sex in the model and allow interaction, um, well, not necessarily allow the slopes to vary, but anyway, so these end up being having the smallest residual error. So, so this seems to be the best here because this, uh, you know, it doesn't have different slopes. Um, but it does have interaction between diet and sex, and it has a covariate. Um, now, if you look at the partial Fs, you see that in fact, this does have very significant um, p-values with respect to all the simpler models. Whereas when you allow the slopes to vary, you find that this is not better than this model. Um, that is with the same slope model, which is up here, you don't, uh, this is, doesn't do better. The P is 0.477. So what we saw with the residual error is reflected in the partial F test, and that is to be expected. And basically, you know, the, to get the residual errors, you have to 
fit all these models separately. You have to fit each one separately. Uh, but with the F test, you don't need to. You start with a model that you think is the most general and then see how it does with the partial F test. If the partial F tests are all significant, then you can say, okay, I don't need to look at the simpler models. Whereas if you started with this, which is even more general, this says, really, you should try it, try this model. And that may be the best. Now, for this best model, so to speak, from the residual error and partial F test, we look at the regression coefficients. Again, all of the coefficients are significant here. And as I said before, it's great when this happens, but sometimes it doesn't happen. What we have now, uh, DC study and T change are really looking at the same thing because TC change is just TC study in as TC pre. So you're taking uh, the, the, the level of cholesterol, total cholesterol on a particular diet and subtracting the starting value as a control or baseline value. So TC change is looking at the change in each person um, and comparing diets. TC change and TC study are two different ways of uh, looking at what is happening to total cholesterol as a result of your dietary intervention. And so you could ask which describes the situation better. And TC change, as I said, is just TC study minus TC pre. We can, we can see if there is a uh, you know, quantitative way to compare the two models. That is, we have a model of TC change with diet and sex, and we have a model of TC study with TC pre and diet and sex. These are the two models. So we can look at the multiple R squared first. The multiple R squared is 7.76 with TC change and 0.9 with TC study. So this looks better because this has a bigger uh, R squared. But I think I know I talked about it maybe more than a couple of weeks ago uh, when when we went over Excel that you can't really compare R squared unless you're looking at the same Y variable, same data for the Y variable. So here we have two different Y variables. We have TC change and TC study. So we can't, we cannot compare uh, the R squared uh, because TC study has a much wider variation than TC change does. And so it may, it can easily happen that even if the fit is not so good, the R squared can look better. So that is something uh, to keep in mind. It is better to look at the residual error. So the residual error is 7.56 here, 7.63 here. Not a big difference, really. So you can really go with either one. But if you said, what is, you know, to give me the best, then I would have to say the TC change is a better model to be looking at that TC study. But it's not a big difference. Before we leave this, you know, somebody may say, well, I have a situation with three factors. So, you know, why doesn't Shaker give me a function to do that? And, you know, CU functions, we don't have. We don't have a, uh, so mainly because the coding starts to get very, very complex. It was pretty messy, even for two-way. And so I don't have an algorithm to construct it, just the many possible comparisons automatically. And uh, so one workaround for people who, you know, must have three factors, whatever, is to construct in Excel combinations of factors you believe interact. For instance, this is the MET uh, data set. Uh, so there are three uh, factors here. You have weight cat, feel, and MET SIP, three factors. So you could combine the three into a new factor, which I'm calling WF M three in one. And you just do this and Excel will do it for you. So you say L2, which is lean, 
and says uh, put it together plus uh, M2 plus N2. So it will combine these two and then it'll become lean plus OK plus yes. So this would be a new variable. This now has, I don't know, uh, it may have 32 possibilities or something like that. I and so you can do something like this and then work with this variable um, as a way to minimize, uh, to reduce the number of factors. So this may not help that much, but this is the best I have to offer. I want to go back a little bit just to give a, a concrete example where all these different functions uh, may get used. Um, this is something that I, uh, that I mentioned when I was talking about regression last week, I think. And uh, so this was a study done in, uh, uh, in Canada in four tertiary NICUs. And they had about two, they had 245 neonates over a fairly wide range of gestational age. And they were interested in seeing um, how much oral sucrose to give uh, before a routine heal lapse. So that was the study. So, and the pain intensity was measured at 30 and 60 seconds. So what you have is that the kids are randomized to one of three doses. And on each dose, they, are, they look at the pain score at 30 seconds and 60 seconds. And uh, the covariate of interest here is the gestational age. Uh, apparently, the, uh, the younger babies are the ones who are more premature, uh, re record more pain. So you have to adjust for that. So now I want to uh, pose uh, different questions that can be asked in the same cohort in this particular study and tell you which CU function you would use for each of those questions. So this is a summary. And uh, along, along with gestational age, uh, so instead of gestational age, you will consider the same prematurity as a second factor, that is less than 36 weeks or more, more than that. And then birth weight, which the article doesn't mention, I'm introducing it just for my pedagogical purpose. So let's say birth weight is also a factor to be controlled for. So with bigger babies showing less pain. So what you have now is that you have three randomized groups and you have prematurity as a second factor and you have birth weight as a covariate. Not so different from our diet study. And so I can think of 14 scenarios uh, to look at in this study. So you can, for instance, you can look at the 30 second pain score among sucrose doses, or you can compare the uh, 30 second pain score controlling for birth weight. And then you can say, uh, controlling for prematurity. And, uh, um, oh, and so on. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to show these uh, questions again with the answers. Uh, when I teach a course, I actually give this as like a homework or uh, poll. And so, okay. So to start with, if you're doing just a pain score among the three doses, you just do one way. Now, if you do a pain score among doses controlling for birth weight, you would do COV one way, where you have pain 30, birth weight at dose. Now, suppose you want to um, control for prematurity as well. So then you have CU two way. We're not taking birth weight into account here. So pain 30, dose prematurity with no interaction. Or uh, you can have, going back to this, you can have controlling for birth weight, but maybe the slope is different with each dose. So you can have that. And uh, so <clears throat> likewise, in the CU2 way, you can have an interaction and so on. Um, 
So I, I won't go through all of this and you know, you could do that at your leisure and see that in fact, for every combination of hypotheses, that is you say, maybe it's, uh, you know, I want to control for birth weight and prematurity. And, uh, you know, I, I don't expect the dose effect to be different between premature, that means there is no interaction and, and so on. Uh, this is all just 30 seconds. Uh, suppose now you say, well, I have two measurements in each child. So I have 30 seconds and 60 seconds. So now you want to compare the two. So you would do a paired T. But suppose you want to compare that with dose as a factor. So then you say, I do a one way of the change with dose. And you can use, can use change 30 to 60 as your outcome variable, like we did in the diet study, change from baseline to study period and, and so on. And then uh, suppose you had three measurements, then you may need to do repeated measures. So that's what we're going to get to next. The repeated measures refers to uh, having multiple measurements in each subject. It could be two, it could be three, it could be 10, whatever. Statisticians call this a mixed models approach. It's called mixed models because you tend to have some factor, but then something is repeated within a subject. So the, you, whereas the data we have looked at so far, each subject, we had just one observation. But if you each subject, you have multiple observations, it becomes a mixed situation because it's the subject is what is called a random factor. And the other factors like diet or dose and so on are fixed factors. So you have a fixed and random factor in the same uh, problem. So you have what is called a mixed model. So you need a mixed models approach in a crossover study. So that's what we're going to do next. Three or more treatments, Delta study that we will work with next. Or you have a follow-up study at mile measurements at three or more milestone points. So you may say, we're going to be looking at, uh, uh, somebody had bariatric surgery, we're gonna be looking at them baseline, immediately post-surgery, three months, six months, 12 months, like that. So these are very specific milestone points and you want to see what is going on. And, but I do want to say, before I get into repeated measures, there are situations where you have multiple measurements where you don't need this mixed models approach. It should mean more than just multiple measurements over time in each subject. Specifically, you don't need a mixed models approach in any study with measurements at just two points, for instance, because with only two points, you can look at the change or percent change. No need for repeated measures. But more importantly, you also don't need repeated measures or mixed models if all the measures are in one sitting, so to speak. So suppose somebody has a glucose tolerance test with four or five measurements, postprandial lipemia and so on, or an up tissue uptake study. So you don't need to complicate matters with uh, repeated measures analysis. You just calculate area under the curve, incremental area under the curve, et cetera, whatever seems appropriate, and then you just compare that. There is no, you just have one observation per subject. And so this is an example and, uh, you know, paper that we published a while ago and studied postprandial lipemia, where we had five measurements in each person. And so we simply calculated the area under the curve and the incremental area under the curve uh, in each person. And then we analyzed that. So there is no need for repeated measure. And this was an example uh, when I taught this course last year, and uh, this was a <clears throat> uptake study. So, so they do each well, make measurements maybe a dozen times over time. But again, the way to analyze it is you take each data from each well and you just fit some curve, whatever the curve is appropriate. Could be an exponential, could be something else. And then you compare 
those derived parameters across the groups. No need for repeated measures. So having said all that, uh, a file in my resources page, if you're interested, you can, you can look at that. And it offers some Excel uh, functions to calculate area under the curve, things like that. So you could use that template, those templates uh, for such calculation. Uh, if you are interested, you can take a look at that file. And if you have any questions, you can email me. Uh, these are some stories uh, that I found, you know, recent uh, where repeated meshes ap uh, appeared in some pediatric literature. Generally, they don't need, they didn't need to do repeated meshes. So here they just had two measurements. So they didn't need repeated measurements. And here, again, they only had two measurements. They didn't need a mixed model approach. And this one, they did do long-term multiple measurements in uh, muscular dystrophy, but it seems that in fact, they could have just gotten slopes, an annual decline in each person and then analyzed. And finally, in this case, they, they looked at, there were three key time points baseline three months, 12 months in uh, subjects with Crohn's. And uh, so now you need a, a mixed model approach. And so that's the idea. So now with all that uh, preamble, let's get to the actual mixed model uh, example that I have from our own work. So this is a paper we published uh, uh, getting yeah, over 20 years now. And uh, this was a, similar to the previous uh, paper where we compared three diets. But the difference here, previously we, everybody was on a, a baseline diet and then they were randomized to either stay on the diet or switch to one of two other diets. Here, each subject was on all three diets. So the order was randomized, uh, but everybody was studied on all three diets. Uh, it turns out that uh, these crossover studies are more powerful. And, uh, and so we switched our design. Uh, but, but on the other hand, pedagogically, the New England Journal paper design turns out to be much more common in clinical research. Uh, when people are studying a new treatment, a new drug, et cetera, that's the design that is most often used. Everybody is on some standard baseline condition and then people get randomized to get either placebo or treatment or placebo or a drug. And so that design, the New England Journal paper, the previous design that we looked at, that actually carries over well into clinical research. And this one is a crossover study. And there are situations where you may have a crossover study. And uh, this is to help you to analyze them. So the three diets, each subject on all three diets. Um, crossover study, random order. Not everybody started on the same diet. So this is called a three period randomized crossover study. So more than two measures, so we need a new approach. So the first thing to note is that in order to analyze this in R, you have to name your variable with some care. Okay, so you notice there are, we have three diets, AAD, step one, and LOSAT. So the three outcome variables we looked at, total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, and triglyceride. So each subject was studied on all three diets. So you can see that there are nine outcomes for each subject. The three lipids done three times. So the outcomes are named by attaching the diet names with a dot. So you see TC is the, mentioned as TC.AAD uh, and TC.STEP1 and TC.LOSAT, okay? So you name it this way so that when, you, when we tell R to analyze these data, analyze TC, it will look at all variables starting with TC and say, ah, looks like, the person has three treatments, 3AD, step one, and low SAT. And then uh, it will do the analysis. Now, of course, sex and age, uh, they were just measured once. So there's no, uh, uh, 
there is nothing to attach. This is how you uh, analyze it. You can copy paste this command. Um, so you notice we're starting to use quotes here. You know, quotation marks are being used around the variable names. And uh, so, and that turns out to be necessary. That's the only way you to convey to R that it should start looking at data, uh, the variables and so on. So, so this says, this is the data set. Remember we, did, we read this data set um, in last week and put it away. So you shouldn't need to start in Excel again. The data set is there in R for you. So you're telling uh, CU RepMess that work with the data set Delta and analyze TG as a function of diet. So uh, there's no need to attach by the way, because you are actually giving the data set name. There's no need to attach Delta before you do this. So, uh, this is not a diet, it's a made up variable name. It's not in the, not in the Excel data. Uh, so it's three levels specified by dot AAD, dot step one, dot LOSAT. So that, that's where the repeated measures are made. And so when you get the output, you will see diet as a, on the X axis and, and a bar graph. So I'll go into detail here. So this is what you're going to get. Uh, you're going to get the TG levels at the, at the three diets. And with the compact letter display showing, you know, what which which groups were different from which other group. So here AAD is different from low sat and step one, and they are not significantly different from each other. Now, if you scroll back, because sometimes you notice here a key difference between this study and what we looked at before. Uh, any JM, CTC change and so on. A key difference here is that the same subjects are there in all three diets. Each subject is studied on all three diets. So that means that you can actually graph diet difference. You can calculate the diet effect in each subject and report the mean and standard deviation. So that is what is done in another bar graph. So if you scroll back your plots window, you will see the TG difference is displayed for each diet effect. AAD minus low set, AAD minus step one, step one minus low set. So that is done here. And, and you, have, uh, you have those results. And then in the console, you first have the, you have the TG difference displayed and you have the TG also displayed and then Finally, you have all the comparisons, the relevant comparisons. So low sat minus AAD, the difference is 10, sat error, so on. Very much like we saw in uh, CU one way. And except that of course, these statistics are done differently than one way because each subject crosses over, crossover study into all three diets. And then the, those, uh, the P values are summarized. And that's it. So I'm going to uh, skip this next part. I think you know you can compare this because we're not looking at any other factor. You could compare this to a paired T that you could do in Excel. So if you do the paired T in Excel, you will get the same differences. Obviously, you must ten and eight point seven three and minus one point two nine, but the p-values would be a little different because here, as we discussed uh, last week, you know, you are taking all the data into account in calculating a pooled standard deviation. So you notice that they have the same standard error here for all the differences, and that's because of the, the model. It C RepMess simply generalizes the paired T to multiple measures. The paired T is only for two measures at a time, so the CU rep says, you know, you can have three, four, whatever. We can do more with mixed models, more than just the pair T generalized. So we can ask the question, is the diet effect different for men and women? So equivalently, you can, that you're asking, is there interaction between sex and diet? So with two diets, 
we would do an unpaired T. We could compute the diet effect in men, say AD minus uh, uh, low SAT, and then do that separately for men and women and do a T test. With three diets, it becomes more complicated. Uh, you can't do a one way or something like that. It doesn't work. So what you do is you do CU rep mess. So you do CU rep mess. It looks like, very much like the previous one, but you add sex. Unlike CU one way, two way, there's no new function. The same function does it. It sees that you have another factor and it does the analysis. So uh, you may want to uh, copy paste this and see that you get the output I'm going to show. So what you see here, you get the summary stats for all the diet differences by sex. And then in the plots, you get uh, the three diets and two sexes within each diet. And then if you scroll back, you will see the differences, uh, the three possible diet effects and each one for uh, women and men separately. And then you have in the console, you have the all the mini comparisons, similar to what we saw in two way. So within women, what are the three diet effects? Within men, what are the three diet effects? And then what is the sex effect in each diet? And then how do the diet effects compare between the sexes? So all that is done and uh, with p-values. These are the uh, p-values for the uh, for any sex difference in the diet effects and basically this is saying there isn't any and diet effects are not uh, uh, significantly different now we will see uh, <clears throat> it does produce a dilemma here if the partial f test is significant then we have a little bit of a problem and this is the problem that the partial f test with a simpler model that is without sex is significant uh, but the interaction p-values are not significant. None of them is significant. I have a dilemma and I don't have a, a solution for you. Um, so as with two-way, uh, when you put interaction in the model, you get lots of different uh, numbers. So whereas before, you without interaction, with just without sex in the model, you just have 10 as the diet effect, low SAT minus AAD. But here, low SAT minus AAD is 7.7 .7 in women and 12.9 in men. Some of them are very different. This is what I showed you before. So without sex, uh, there is not much. But with the second factor of the model, you get a lot of comparisons made at uh, p-values for them. You could have additional variables that you want to put into the model. Say maybe you want to put age in the model and so on. And this we will talk about after logistic regression. We have all of these uh, functions that we have talked about so far. So I have a flow chart, uh, which I also have on the resources page in uh, PowerPoint uh, format. So you may find that useful. So uh, on your PDF now, you're just going to have the filled out, the full flow chart. Uh, but uh, on on the website, you I have a PowerPoint version, and you may find that helpful. This is what I'm what I'm about to show you. So if the data are normal, you summarize by mean standard deviation, first variation. If not normal, you summarize by median and IQR. Going back to normal data, when you have two groups, you do an unpaired T. Here, when you have two groups. You do a Wilcox and rank sum. If you have more than two groups, you do a one way. Yeah, here you have more than two groups, you do one way with E bars equal to four. Now, what if you only have one group? So if you just have one subject, n of one, you can all you can do is a z-score. Here, if you just have n of one, you might report a percentile. If you have some number of subjects, you can do one sample T versus the population mean. And here you do a Wilcox and signed rank that we talked about. If you have more than one variable, you can do a correlation. And here, if you have more than one variable, you do a Spearman correlation. Okay. Now, suppose with one group, you have two treatments, like what we just saw. 
a crossover study. With only two, you can do a paired team. And in the not normal data, you do a signed rank. We, we talked about that last week. And, but if you have more than two treatments and a crossover, you, have, you do repness. And here you do something called the Friedman. And uh, now that is all you can do with uh, data that are not normally distributed. Anything more than that, additional factors, covariates, I can't help you. Um, but with the normal data, if you have other factors and covariates, with a single group, with a crossover, you can look at the change and do uh, one way, two way, et cetera. If you have more than two, uh, you do repness. And if you have two groups or more than two groups and you have additional factors, you do either a two way or carve one way, carve two way, and so on. So that's the general strategy. And I, I think I showed you this last week, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'm just mentioning it briefly here. The crib sheets are uh, also available in the resources page. We have a web tool that you can play with. You actually start using our function for your own data, uh, where you can choose a function, and then it will it will help you figure out what the R command that you should uh, uh, put into R Studio for your analysis. You can copy paste that. Okay, and this is an overview of uh, CU functions uh, with some detail about what each function does. There's a funny cartoon. I hope, why don't you look at it for a minute? And there's just a, a point that Randall Monroe is making here is that things can be correlated uh, just because there is some secular trend in both. There is a secular trend in uh, baby names in the US, and there is also uh, an actual thing that uh, chicken pox vaccine became available at some point. So I remember when uh, with my children, you know, born close to 40 years ago, uh, our pediatrician wanted us to socialize with kids who had chicken pox uh, so that the kids would get chicken pox as children and, uh, and, and be immune after that. I think I talked about this last week, and uh, uh, you know I might uh, show a little video about it later on. All the CU functions, they report nominal p-values. Uh, there is uh, no particular adjustment for multiple comparisons. And the reason I don't do that is that uh, these, com these adjustments don't take into account that somebody is looking at multiple outcomes. So now, finally, we're getting to categorical outcomes. You can use R for categorical outcomes in these following ways. And you can do two by twos, um, which I already showed you, you know, we have a web tool for. So I'm not going to do it, try to do that. Uh, just a simple two by two. Uh, you can do what is called a binomial test. <clears throat> I have slides for that, but I'm going to skip. Um, I think, uh, I think, you know, it's not that, uh, common a situation and, uh, you, you know, I have it just for some completion sake. So we will do this seriously. That is the, these functions we have looked at so far. So you one way, two way roughness, uh, can also be used for categorical variables. The output gets much messier, uh, because there are so many two by twos that you can construct out of uh, a big uh, grid, two-dimensional, three-dimensional grid. And so it does get a little uh, messy. And uh, so then after that, we will do logistic regression. Okay. That's my hope. And then do Kaplan-Meier and Cox proportional hazards modeling next week. So all of these are, are for categorical variables. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to uh, skip this. I have it partly because uh, I dislike this activity, American football. Uh, and <clears throat> so I like to talk about concussions and uh, that people are engaged in dangerous activity. But really, just the idea is that in some situations, 
uh, where you have a lot of uh, events taking place, uh, you know, for instance, in American football, the number of plays that are done in a in a year is enormous. So so you can compare uh, the number of concussions from one year to the next without actually knowing uh, how many total plays they were. And uh, so that's the idea in a binomial test. So I'm going to uh, uh, skip this part. This is where I want to start with the contingency table. So remember we did two by twos in uh, you know, the very first lecture. And uh, so we had a say risk factor low, high, controls and cases and two by two, and we did, we did a variety of two by two. So then we want to extend two by two. We will do the contingency table. We want to extend two by two analysis after that. So you have more than one fact that you want to look at. You do logistic regression. If you have a time to caseness, you do Kaplan-Meier analysis. And if you have both of these, you do Cox proportional hazard model. But anyway, before we get to that, I want to talk about contingency table in R. If you look at uh, these two data sets, um, the, in MET, we have, uh, I have some made up categorical outcomes. These are not part of our original data, but I, I made them up just for teaching purposes. So in, uh, in MET, we had medicine, which, which was part of our data, but I made up these two categories, weight, cat, and feel. So weight category is just based on BMI. Uh, it's not made up, it's derived from that. So 24 is lean, 29 is overweight, and so on. And, uh, and this I made up. So just the person, uh, how the person feels. And then in, uh, in Delta, I made up a categorical variable called like, which is measured on all three diets. And so just as a way for you to, uh, to show you how to analyze that. That's all. So a question we can ask is, is metabolic syndrome, this is from the MET data set, is it associated with BMI? So you, do, you need to attach MET uh, because we did attachment last week, but that won't be remembered now. So you need to attach MET and then we do see you one way, but note the key difference here. The key difference here is that met -SIN is not a continuous variable. It's not like TC change or TC study or anything. It is actually a categorical variable. And we are asking see you one way, is this categorical variable distributed differently in the different weight category. We have lean, overweight, and obese. How is it distributed? So when you do that, this is the table. 85 subjects are divided into lean, obese, overweight, and uh, no metabolic syndrome or yes metabolic syndrome in this fashion. It's, uh, among the lean, uh, nearly all are without metabolic syndrome. Whereas in <clears throat> the obese, Quite a few have metabolic syndrome and likewise an overweight. You can do an overall p-value, but this is not particularly helpful. We don't just want to know, is there an association? We may want to know specifically, is, that, is the metabolic syndrome different between lean and obese, between lean and overweight, and so on. So that's what this output does. It tells you no versus yes, in the three possible comparisons, lean versus obese, lean versus overweight, obese versus overweight. And it, for each of them, it gives the numbers are to compare and the p-values. So there are three possible comparisons uh, which are made here. There is also a bar graph. So the bar graph gives you the distribution in numbers there are like 26 in the lean category and all but one do not have metabolic syndrome. And this is yes metabolic syndrome, this is no metabolic syndrome. So it gives that for the three groups. This is not very nice because uh, all these packages, they order the variables alphabetically. So you get lean, obese, overweight. That's the alphabetical order. But that's not the 
order that you would want to present your data or look at your data. You would really like to have lean, overweight, obese. So the way you achieve that is to say G1 order equals lean, overweight, obese. So you can copy paste this. So if you do that, you will get this bar graph. Of course, the p-values are not, are not going to change, but you get a bar graph like this, where you have lean, overweight, and obese. So maybe this makes the point a little bit better. I don't know uh, about, but anyway, it's a matter of uh, choice. Now, you may want to compare lean versus not lean, because overweight and obese are both heavier than lean. And likewise, you may want to compare obese with not obese. So for that, at least the way my CU function works, you have to put weight cat first. Even though it's not the outcome variable, you have to put that first and use something called ordinal to avoid the alphabetical order. So again, you can copy paste this. You notice I've reversed weight cat and medicine. And, and because it's the dependent variable so-called here, I use the word ordinal and I give the order. And when I do that, I get p-values like this. I get lean versus not lean and not less than obese versus obese because it assumes that there is, a, there is an ordering to the variable, lean, overweight, obese. And so you are interested in comparing lean versus anybody above lean and obese with anybody below obese. So it gives you those comparisons. Of course, you get the bar graph, uh, which is different now because uh, you, you have reversed the y and x variable. So now we get to feel. Uh, so, so this is the made up variable, a good, okay, bad. Now, is this feeling associated with weight, cat, and sex? That's the question I want to ask. And so we have two factors. Again, this is all made up. Uh, sex variable is also made up. So nothing here uh, has anything to do with reality, but just for teaching purposes. And we have two factors that may influence the outcome, weight cat and sex. So we need to use two way. So again, we don't want the alphabetical order, like good, okay, bad is not in the order that you want because, because the alphabetically it'll come out bad, good, okay. And so for, for weight cat, we don't like this order. And for feel, we don't like this order. We don't like the alphabetical order. So you have a really long command now to copy paste. So weight cat G1 order is lean, overweight, obese. And the ordinal feel is bad, okay, good. So you do that, and now the output is very, very messy because you have, you can see here, you have six possible combinations of sex and weight category, and you have three field levels. So you can construct lots and lots of two by twos from this uh, three by six matrix. And so, I've tried to be as exhaustive as possible, but it also means a lot of output. Three by six table, many two by twos are possible. So what happens first is bad versus better than bad. That is okay or good, bad versus okay. You compare the weight categories within each sex. So, so for instance, you have lean and lean female, overweight female. How does the bad, versus not bad compare between these two groups. So here you have zero and 13, and here you have six and 12. So that's what it is here. 13 over 13, 13 of 13, that is here, versus 12 of 18, 12 of 18. And says that has a certain relative risk and a p-value. Highlighted here, overweight versus obese. So that is 12 of 18, which is here, versus seven of 11. 7 out of 11, and it gives you p-values for that. And, and then, of course, uh, 
lean versus obese, which is here, that would be 13 out of 13 and seven out of 11. So it does that. Now, the whole thing can be done for men as well, right? That's what those are the black braces show. So already you have six comparisons have been made now within sex of, uh, of these effects. Now we can start to compare uh, the sexes within the weight categories. So you can say within lean, how does it compare? The 13 over 13 and 13 over 13. How do they compare? Of course, there is no difference. Or within overweight, how do the sexes compare? You are 12 out of 18, 12 out of 18, no difference. But, and within obese, how do they compare? Seven out of 11, four out of 12. So that's a little different, but still not significant. Okay, now it starts to get a little messier. Now, just as we did in two way, you can say, is the sex difference different between weight categories? So is F versus M different between lean versus overweight? Uh, this turns out to be more complex. It's not a two by two. And uh, so, so you have to co construct these log uh, <clears throat> relative risk or odd ratios and calculate uh, confidence intervals and get p-values. So that is all done by the program. Talked about comparing men and women within lean, within overweight, and within obese. So that was this. But then you can compare the sex effect, sex difference between weight categories. So, so this difference, how does it compare with this difference? And that is down here. And how does this difference, com this difference compare with this difference? Overweight and obese. And finally, how does the sex difference in lean compare with the sex difference in obese? So these additional. And so that is done down here. So this particular thing, these last three, cannot be expressed as some two by two. Um, there's more complicated uh, uh, you know, math involved uh, with uh, log odds ratios and so on. And so, uh, so that calculation is done and you have the result here. Um, okay, so all this is done just for bad versus okay plus good. Then you can do the whole thing uh, for, you can do bad plus okay versus good. So that is done, uh, less than good versus good is done here. So, so you have this many comparisons that are possible from what, what we started with. This is in some sense, because you don't, you don't just have mean and standard deviation, you actually have a different number of levels for this categorical variable feel, uh, you have many, many comparisons that you can make. And, uh, and the, which is all just much considerably simplified when you have a continuous variable. So you end up with many more comparisons in, uh, with categorical outcomes here. You get a bar graph uh, with uh, weight, cat, and sex. So I just want to mention one thing here. Again, not that this particular graph is so important for you, but this may be a problem that you will encounter with your own data. If you have a lot of bars in a bar graph, you're going to lose some uh, text here because the plotting program says, I don't have space to write out all these things. So it skips some of them. So when that happens, what you need to do is to, <clears throat> you position the cursor at the, left edge of plot show up like this. It'll, it'll show up like a four-pointed shape will show up. Uh, and at that point, you can drag that plot window so that it gets wider. And when it gets wider, you will get, you'll get something like this where all the uh, labels are proper. So it's not that the program cannot display 
more than some number of labels, but it really depends on the size of your window. If the plot window is wide enough, it'll display everything. Otherwise, you have to widen it. Just one more thing, I think, before I move on. Uh, you can add scale equals percent to your uh, analyses. You know, going back to the CU2 way, if you add scale equals percent, you will get bar graph where each bar adds up to 100. So some people find this more useful because they can see how the, the proportion that is good, say, how it changes. You can see here, proportion that is good is decreases from lean to overweight to nothing in obese. And the proportion that is bad, feeling bad, increases from lean to overweight to obese. And of course, folks, this is the like, the feel is completely made up. And I made it up to show something like this. And, uh, but of course, you may also want to see what the ends are in the different bars. And that is given here at the top of the bar. It tells you what the, what the ends are. We are done with one way and two way with categorical outcomes. And now we'll talk about repeated measures. So we will now work with delta. And uh, remember I mentioned that I had a made up variable called like. We will now compare like across diet and with possible uh, sex as a factor. So is this liking associated with diet? So again, we don't want the alphabetical order <clears throat> for like. Uh, so like actually has five levels. It's sort of like a Likert scale. And uh, I'm going bad, best, good, okay, worst. This is the alphabetical order. Obviously, this is not the order we would want it. So you would copy paste and say, the order should be worst, bad, okay, good, best. So this is what you will get. So if you do rep mess, like with diet and uh, with this ordinal, all, all five values given, uh, this is the output you should get. And uh, you will get uh, an idea of what the like distribution is across diets. It tells you, uh, you know, how many uh, AAD, how many on AAD were worse than bad and so on. What happened on low set, what happened on step one. But because it's repeated measures, just as we could do TG diff before when we did repeated measures, we could look at the TG difference uh, because each subject was on all three diets. Here too, each subject is on all three diets, same study. So we can look at how the like variable changed. So for instance, when you went from AAD to low SAT in the data, two people stayed at worst. Eight people went from worst to okay. Three people went from worst to good. Five went from worst to best. So what you see is that when people, the people who are at worst mood in AAD, they generally tended to improve. Of course, this is a made up thing on my part. And that's the idea. <clears throat> and the people who are feeling bad, those 18 people, you know, they, <clears throat> nobody felt worse when they went to low sat. Some stayed the same and the others improved, 16 improved. So, so that's the picture I want to sort of <clears throat> work with. And similarly going from uh, low sat to step one or AAD to step one. That is for each of the diet changes, how did the, this Likert scale, the like variable, how did that change? How many went in different possibilities? Each subject are all three diets. So how many of the 18 who think AAD is bad, think better or worse of low sat, et cetera? And that is given here, as I mentioned. So you get a summary table that says, uh, how many went down four points? That is, by going down four means they went from best to worst. How many stayed the same? How many went up and so on? And, and so when you do that uh, and you do it for, this is one way to summarize because otherwise you have these five values, starting values in each diet and then 
you have five possible things that they can end up in. So you have 25 possible outcomes going from one diet to another. And so you want to simplify that some way. The one way to simplify it is to say, is to just say how many steps. Of course, there is a, there is a assumption here that maybe going from uh, going one step down means the same thing. That is going from bad to worse, it's similar to going from good to okay and so on. If you don't feel that way, you can't actually analyze the data because you have too many possibilities. So you have to group them in some way otherwise. Or you have to switch to non-parametric analysis. You can do that. You can take these five values and just call them uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then do all this analysis non-parametrically with E bars equal to four. That you could do. Um, but if we're, we're saying with categories and, uh, and, and we think that we can make that assumption Going down one step means the same thing, regardless of where you start. Likewise, or going up one or two steps. So you can have this summary table, and then there is group all up one level as up one, worst to, worst to bad, bad to okay, okay to good, good to best. All of them are called up one in this uh, along here. And, uh, and so now you can compare ups and downs, uh, by what is called binome test. It's a, a sometimes also called the sign test. So you can say how many went up by three and how many went down by three and uh, what happened. So you can see here uh, up more than three is five people went up by four. Four people went down by four. That's five to four. And that is not significant. And likewise, how many went, went up by one, more than one, compared to went down by more than one? That turns out, for instance, to go from AAD to step one, you have 28 people went up by more than one, and 24 people went down by more than one. Again, non-significant, but is, that's the idea. You know, this is how you could try to interpret your results. And, or you could say how many just, you know, went up versus how many went down. So you could, that is, that you just exclude the people who didn't change and you look at everybody who went up with everybody who went down and compare. Again, in this case, there was no significant difference, but you know, in some, in your data, it doesn't have to be, uh, doesn't have to be. And this is, the, this is how you would compare and report. And finally, you get the, the bar graphs as before. You get uh, more detailed stuff here because you have up and down and, uh, and, and you get uh, these, uh, the, 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 these grouped categories, up by one, down by one, and so on. And that is summarized uh, for the different diet changes. So finally, we can ask, what if you have Another factor, sex. It's very similar to repness uh, with continuous variable. You just add sex as a variable. And you can copy paste this. So if you do this, uh, even more output, because you now have six possible uh, situation uh, with people crossing over within F and within M and so on. And so five by six table, repeated measures, many possibilities. And, and so you have uh, very similar to what we did before. Uh, we can say AAD to low SAT in women. So 34 went up and 12 went down. So this is highly significant. So what this is saying is that of the 46 women that we had, when they switch from AAD to low SAT, 34 of them <clears throat> felt better. They liked it better. And 12 of them did not like it better. So, and that is significant. And it, it went the other way. In men, 12 uh, liked it better and 26 uh, liked it worse. So 
and also significant, but in the opposite direction, and so on. So you have six bars now um, instead of three bars. You have six bars with the distribution, and uh, you know the uh, and again the up down counts and so on. I have no idea whether any of this is useful to people. These are all the things I could think of to produce, and so I'm doing that. Okay, so folks, we are we are done with the repeated measures and uh, you know those functions that we already seen before being applied to categorical outcomes. So we are now ready to proceed beyond contingency tables. So we did biomath.stat the first day, and today we did one-way, two-way rep mess, all for contingency tables, big grids, whatever. Uh, and then extract two by twos from them and do p-values. So now we're going to get seriously into these other things, which I already um, talked about before. What if you have more than one factor? We do logistic regression. What if you have time to caseness? And I'll explain what I mean when I get to Kaplan-Meier analysis. Basically, you don't just say somebody got discharged from the hospital or didn't. You say, how long did they stay in the hospital? Or you don't just say whether somebody lived or died. You say, uh, what was the time it took for them to die? Or how long did it take for the cancer to recur? So you have time to case this and with censored data. And censored data means you don't have complete data on everybody, uh, either because you lost them to follow up or simply because uh, you haven't set, you followed them long enough. So a lot of our residents, pediatric residents, do projects that involve looking back at uh, the past. So if they look at transplanted children, some kids were transplanted 10 years ago. So you have 10-year follow-up on them. But some kids were transplanted six months ago. So you only have six months of follow-up. You have complete data, but you don't have the same follow-up in every person. And that is called censoring your data are censored either because they are lost to follow or because you started studying them uh, later than others. And that happens, we do Kaplan-Meier analysis. And that's when we will use CUKM. And finally, you could have both. You could have more than one factor that influences your outcome and time to caseness. So if that happens, you need to do Cox proportional hazards modeling. And so these are the three uh, main functions that I have left to, to teach. And uh, so we will, we will do that in order. So logistic regression is the next step after two by two. And uh, so uh, that is you have a categorical outcome with more than one independent variable. And that requires logistic regression. So you can have two possible goals here. One is prediction. And what I'm going to teach you will work fine for that. The other is to quantify risk. And there things get a little tricky. If, uh, you know, people who are in my lecture the very first uh, week would know that uh, I think that in most uh, clinical studies, odd ratios are not appropriate. They're only appropriate in case control studies. And, uh, uh, but that's what usual logistic regression gives you, gives you odd ratios. So you need to find a way to convert um, the odd ratio to relative risk or to model risk itself, which I'm not going to deal with here. Okay, so we're going to continue to work in the MET tab. Primary data, the primary reason I have that tab is that this was a study that we did in 85 subjects and we had BMI and some blood levels and also metabolic syndrome status in these people. And the goal was to predict metabolic syndrome from the other variables. I mean, the clinical judgment was made, but here, just for teaching purposes, I say, can we predict metabolic syndrome from these five variables? HDL cholesterol, log TG, BMI, glucose, and insulin. 
I want to start with something very simple as a way to motivate logistic regression. I first want to know, does metabolic syndrome depend on BMI? Now, outcome is categorical, but with just one independent variable, we can just as well ask, is the BMI vary with metabolic syndrome? And so these two questions are the same, really. And either is answered by testing association. Uh, so we can do a t-test of BMI in metabolic syndrome, yes versus no. So again, just uh, this digression is there partly because you have a categorical variable and you want to uh, look at its dependence on a continuous variable. But if it's just one variable, it's easier just to reverse that and do a t-test. And then you can interpret it. And the t-test test for association, you interpret the significance as showing metabolic syndrome depends on BMI or BMI depends on metabolic syndrome, et cetera. But what we want to say is metabolic syndrome depends on BMI. Okay, so you can copy paste this. Uh, you see you one way, BMI makes it. And when you do that, you get a p-value. Now you can do that for each of these with medicine, each of these variables of interest. But it's really logistic regression looks at all of them together in one shot. So that's logistic regression. So this is what I would like you to copy paste. We are saying CU logist, MET is the data set. Again, notice the use of double quotes again for the variable. METSIN is the variable of interest that we want to predict. And we're going to start with just one variable, log DG. It's not the full model of interest, but just as a way to get going. So when you do that, you will get an output like this. You will get some console output and you will get what is the curve, which I'll, which I'll describe in detail uh, in a few minutes. And so this says, if you look at log TG alone, how well does it predict um, metabolic syndrome? And uh, so, so you get p-value uh, for it and, uh, and some odds ratios that are calculated and, uh, and uh, two by two that shows if you use the best model that you get out of it, uh, how well does it classify the subjects? So we will go through all of these in detail. Okay, so that was just a little digression with just one variable. If, if it helps people feel more at home with it. And so this is what we want to actually focus on. So it's the same data set, dependent variable, but now you have five predictors, HDL, log TG, BMI, glucose, insulin. So I would like you to copy paste this. And so uh, the way I have written CU Logist, I first do all these one variable comparisons so that you get a feel for what is going on. Uh, you know, so you can see here, uh, the very first table that is put out is a little bit like CU table one, where you have each variable across the, uh, the two categories uh, for medicine, but you also have the comparisons. So what you see here is that each of these five variables is not an unreasonable predictor because each of them is different between metabolic syndrome, no versus yes. I mean, different levels of p-values, but they're all significant. And so that is why I chose those five. But when you put all of them together, they may not all remain significant. Does that make sense, I hope? Okay, so you know, that is the metabolic syndrome may be associated with each of these separately. But when you consider them together, maybe some of them don't add anything to what the others provide. And that's what we're going to see now. So the p-values are promising. So now CU Logist uh, then calls a function called GLM. That's a basic R function, which does this generalized linear modeling. That's what you do when you have a categorical outcome. Again, I'm not expecting you to use GLM. My idea is that you will in fact use my function for your purposes. It does that and, it, and this is the result you get. 
So take a look at the p-values. What we see here um, with the p-values is that HDL, glucose, and insulin are not significant. That is, when all five are in the model, three of them cease to be significant. Now, the temptation would be, let's just drop those three, and that would be correct in this case, but that is not true in general. What Theologist does next is it uses a function called dredge. Again, I'm not expecting you to know these functions, which looks at every combination of predictors possible. So in this case, you have five predictors. Each predictor can be in or out. That means you have two raised to five or 32 possible models. So it does all 32 and then it ranks Okay, so that's what it does. And we are going to use it not only here, but also in linear regression and uh, uh, Cox modeling, and you can do it in repeated measures also. So this is what you should have in your console output after that initial, uh, after that uh, uh, regression p-values, you will see a model selection table. And that says, what is the best model? And then, what is the ranking of all the models. The way to read this table is it lists all the variables at the top, BMI, glucose, HDL, insulin, log DG. The top model has a value, a regression coefficient for BMI and log DG. That means that this model only has two variables, those two variables, whereas the next model as BMI, insulin, and log TG. So that has those three variables. So that's how you read this table. Each line is for a different model. I generally ask it to display only 16 models, but you can display all of them if you like. So these are the top 16 models. You can see here, model 32, the way it numbers things, is the complete model, the one that we looked at before. And you can see that these coefficients, the regression coefficients here are the same as was in the previous uh, slide. And, but it's not the best model. It is somewhere like eighth or 10th or something like that, eighth, I guess. And uh, the top model with BMI and log TG is the best. So how are the models ranked? That is again, not something that you need to know and remember. There's something called Akaike information criterion after a Japanese statistician, and, uh, and that is given here. This is the Akaike information criterion. And, and by that criterion, this has the smallest value, a little bit like the residual error. And it says, therefore, this is the best. You can see this is the ranking. Uh, the, as you go down, the AIC goes up. Now, this is the, this log-like field is actually represents something like how good the fit is. Because you could, there's an obvious logical problem here because how can a model with only two parameters fit better than a model with five parameters? Surely the model with five parameters ought to fit at least as well as the simpler model, if not a little better. May not be statistically significant, but it shouldn't be worse. Answer is that, uh, yes, indeed, if you just look at the algebraically, you want this to be as big as possible. It's called log likelihood. And so this indeed has the highest value, algebraically highest value, minus 27.6. All the others are bigger negative numbers. So this does have the best likelihood or the smallest residual, but dredge penalizes for additional parameters. So this one has five parameters. This one only has two parameters. So with the penalties, that's where you get the AIC. And so this is just the best. Again, it's not that I want you to be knowing this all the time or something, but I do want you to know why a, a simpler model gets chosen as the best. So it, 32 has, the full model has to fit as well or better 
with three extra predictors, but it's just a little better and there is a penalty for each additional predictor. So the AIC is larger. Okay, so then CU Logist reruns GLM. It uh, reruns GLM with the chosen model. And, and that's what you see here. So it just BMI and log DG and the coefficients are highly significant. And, uh, and, and so now I'll go through the rest of the output in some detail. So one thing you may want to know is what, what are the odds ratios? And so the odds ratios are calculated from this table. Uh, it's really just e to that. So if you take uh, uh, 0.2656, you take e to that, you get 1.3, e to the 2.9 is 18.2 and so on. So these are the odds ratios and you have confidence intervals on the odds ratios. And then uh, finally, we come to something called uh, ROC or the receiver operating characteristic curve. I mean, it's a very awkward uh, term. It goes back to electrical engineering, as I recall from my engineering days. And the, the model gives you a formula. So for any subject, you can cap, you can, calculate a logistic that is you can say take the subject say the subject has a bmi of 25 and a triglyceride of 100 say uh, what if say the log tg is 5 then you can say take minus 23.2963 plus 25 times this minus plus four uh, five times this and you get a score and that score is sort of like a probability of the person having metabolic syndrome. And, uh, but what should the cut point be? The cut point can be zero, can be minus two, plus two, whatever. So as you change the cut point, the sensitivity and specificity, which people may recall from many weeks ago, or the residents may know otherwise. And uh, it, so the sensitivity and specificity will vary as the cut point increases. And that's what the ROC curve shows for, a, for this particular model that you end up with. As I say here, if the cut point is very low, you get 100% sensitivity because you're going to be calling everybody having metabolic syndrome. But that means you'll have 0% specificity. If the cut point is very high, you will get 100% specificity because you're going to call everybody non-metabolic syndrome, but you'll have zero sensitivity because you're not going to call anyone as metabolic syndrome. So I want to show you with an example. Uh, you don't have to do this. I took the first 10 subjects in that MET data file and I sorted them by BMI. So, so the BMIs go from 21.2 to up to 29.6. Suppose we said, this is just for you to get to understand the ROC curve. That, that's all, that's, that's the purpose of this digression. So if we just took those 10 subjects, and this is their metabolic syndrome status. The first two don't have, the third one did, the, the next two didn't, and so on. Now we can calculate sensitivity specificity uh, for different BMI cutoffs. So the true positives are four, the true negatives are six. Okay, suppose you pick a cut point uh, like 21. That is, you're going to say anyone above 21 has metabolic syndrome, anyone below 21 doesn't. What that will do is it'll give you 100% sensitivity because these four true positives are going to be called metabolic syndrome. But specificity is just horrible, is zero because all the people without metabolic syndrome are also going to be called metabolic syndrome because you're using this cut point. Okay, suppose now you use a cut point of 22. Still are classifying all four true positives as metabolic syndrome, but now this subject is classified correctly as not having metabolic syndrome because the cut point is above that. So one out of six is the specificity. I hope people see the logic here. 
So I don't have to go through each step. So the next one, if you choose say 23.9, you this is still 100%. This now goes up to 33%. Now, if now use 24.5 as the cut point, sensitivity goes down because this person now is misclassified. So you're classifying three out of four correctly. And this remains at two over six, three over six, four over six. So this is now, if you choose 26.5, you have 75% sensitivity and 67% specificity. Maybe that's the best you can do with just BMI. And you can fill in the rest. You can see that if you go up to like 30 as your cut point, you're going to be classifying all the true negatives correctly, 100% specificity, but 0% sensitivity. So this is what gets done in the ROC curve for logistic regression. You have a more complex function, but the idea is the same. You, you say you calculate the logistic function for each subject, and then you say, if I move the cut point from low to high, what happens to sensitivity specificity? This is the, this is the model. And using this model, uh, what happens at different cut points? Now, your logist or GLM chooses this intercept so that if you use zero as the cut point, you get maximum accuracy. Accuracy is a combination of sensitivity and specificity. You basically say how many people are classified correctly. So with that cut point, this is the two by two you get. That is out of the 85 subjects, there were 65 with about, without metabolic syndrome and 62 of them were classified correctly. And 20 had metabolic syndrome and 12 were classified correctly. The people without metabolic syndrome, 62 out of 65 were classified correctly. That is a specificity. And the 20 with metabolic syndrome, 12 were classified correctly. So that 12 out of 20, that is 60% sensitivity. So you can also report, uh, and the accuracy, which is maximized at zero, means 74 out of 85 were classified correctly, and that's 87.1%. That's the accuracy. And the AUC is, so if you just want to go back, and this is the reason I did that digression at the beginning, if you use only log TG, that is not BMI as well, but just log TG, you get sensitivity of 45%, which we saw even in the, those 10 people, BMI alone doesn't do a very good job. And AUC was 0.8, not as good as 0.88. <clears throat> so this is the curve. This basically says, as you change the cut point, sensitivity and specificity vary like this. And uh, closer to one, the better. The ideal AUC would be, would just go straight up and over. And, uh, and a really terrible AUC would just go like a 45 degree line. Eulogist fits odd, calculates the odd ratios. And uh, this is not a case control study. We had a cohort of 85 people and we had metabolic syndrome in 20 people and so on. So, <clears throat> And I don't have, unfortunately, a good solution for this. And uh, I plan in the next iteration, I plan to uh, derive uh, relative risks from the odd ratio values, but I don't have it up yet. And uh, act, you can't tell GLM to fit uh, relative risk, fit model risk, but it doesn't seem to go very well. So I, I would, I'm just going to skip this. <clears throat> uh, even the workaround I have doesn't seem to always work. So uh, um, that's a work in progress. So we'll skip that. Um, so next question that you have to uh, be aware of in your own work, not for the example I'm giving, in your own work, if you have a lot of predictors which are highly correlated, then it may not be possible to fit the full model. So I made up some data where the variables, the predictors were correlated. And so when I did that, it, it just crashed saying, uh, 
GLM algorithm didn't converge, etc. It just, you know, it just gives up. So you do may have to prune your predictors a little bit if your predictors are too highly correlated. Uh, the other problem with uh, using taking this approach is a dredge function cannot handle more than 30 predictors. Now, you can see why that is, because as I mentioned, when we had five predictors, there were two raised to five possibilities. That is 32 possibilities. If you're doing 30 predictors, you have two raised to 30 possibilities, which is in the billion, if I remember right. It's uh, something like 64K squared, whatever that comes out to be. That's in the billion. So that's just a lot of uh, models to look at. And so uh, dredge will not do it. But it turns out there is a practical limit. I have found just some made up data. Uh, and this is not a very thorough study. So don't take these numbers that seriously. It was 10 predictors. It, was, it just zipped through, no problem. With 15 predictors on my laptop, it took three minutes to do the calculations. With 20 predictors, it didn't come back after one hour and I gave up. So, and of course on your computers, it may be very different, but this is something to keep in mind that made CU Logist sort of very convenient, easy to use and so on, but there is this limit on number of predictors and also if the predictors are too highly correlated. So if you have lots of possible predictors, you have to use these R functions, which I'm not going to delve into now uh, with uh, GLM and step. Step is a function, R function, that will take your model and then throw variables out one at a time or add variables one at a time and, and get to model. So, and then you can run CU Logist with what step ends up with. So it step proceeds logically to drop or add one variable at a time. And each step, it chooses the variable that will lower the AIC the most. So it's a very logical approach. And until functions like dredge came along, this is all that people had. Even now you'll see papers that say that they approached it in a stepwise fashion. So that's what they mean. And uh, so if you have a lot of predictors, you will have to take that approach and run step. And, but I would say still, once you've gotten to some sort of a model, and then you can run that with CU Logist so that you have a ranking of models and so on. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to skim through this uh, because you can, <clears throat> it's pretty self-evident and uh, it's just that you have to use GLM as a, as a function and then you would run step and, and it this will go through the steps. It drops HDL and then it drops glucose and then um, it drops insulin so that it ends up with the same best model that we got, log DG and BMI. And it says no, no next step will improve things and it stops. This is sort of just a summary of that and it shows uh, um, where it ends. And then um, you can also go forward. You can start with nothing in the model and then add variables in, in some, uh, from a list. And uh, again, it starts and adds log DG and BMI, and then it quits because there is nothing uh, else that can be added. So that is a forward stepwise procedure. And uh, so I would say uh, try both, uh, but only do it if CU just gives up, you know, that it can't manage too many variables. The key point for me, why, I, would, I like to use CU Logist with Dredge is that you don't just get one best model. You get a ranking of models. And it may be that, uh, that the top model doesn't make as much biological or clinical sense as the model 
that is number two or number three. So you can say then, maybe I can work with model number three, model three, because I can explain it better, makes more sense. And, and it doesn't make that much of a difference. So that would be the, uh, the approach. So, uh, so this is just again, winding up with step showing how it uh, converts to the final model. Um, so, so the same approach can be taken in linear regression as well. So you, if you say LDL, if you try to predict LDL um, uh, from, from a bunch of variables, and uh, now it won't be logist because you have a continuous variable. You have CU linreg. I haven't told you about this function before, but that's what this function does. This function will model a continuous variable as a function of a bunch of factors, which can be continuous or categorical. So, uh, so that's what it does here. And you can see here that, uh, that everything is significant except for BMI. And so when it goes through dredge, it drops BMI and says, this is the best, uh, the model without BMI is the best model. And um, um, I, I went over the AIC and so on before. And so it fits the data. So the problem with uh, multiple linear regression, when you have multiple continuous variables, is that there is no way to present graphical results because you have so many dimensions. So something called added variable plots, where uh, statisticians find this useful. I don't expect you to find it useful. Uh, beyond that, you can look at this is a scatter plot of the data uh, of the dependent variable against each independent variable, LDL versus HDL, LDL with a log TG and so on. But each variable has been adjusted for all the other variables in the model. And so you get a scatter plot. And so if you have some points that are outside the line, you know, that may be of interest for you to look at. You may want to look at subject eight, who doesn't seem to fit at least a couple of these models, most of the models, and maybe uh, some other subjects and so on. So beyond that, I don't know what use there is of the added variable part, but I produce them, uh, you know, for whatever use there may be. And uh, so, and I, and I mentioned in repeated measures also, you can add, more variables if you like, and uh, and that is done with the syntax, which I'm going to uh, skip over because it's, it's a pretty unusual sort of thing. And somebody who needs to do this because it's a crossover study, first of all, and then you want to have additional variables. This is what will happen. You get some summary, and this is an example where I actually prefer the second best model compared to the top model. Uh, because it's a simpler model and uh, and it does almost as well. And uh, so so I can tell the uh, CU uh, rep mess, don't use the top model, use the second model. That's what this says. Use mod equal two, and you get the you get a final model. Going back to my flow chart, so this is what uh, we did. Um, so far. So the next step is to look at time to caseness and sensor data. And so, so this is uh, Kaplan Meyer analysis and uh, CUKM. And that's what we're going to do next. This is a figure graph I picked up from a journal article where they took a cohort of uh, men diagnosed with colon cancer uh, in 98 to 2000 and they followed them up to about 2011, 2012, and, they, and these are the data. They had complete data, it's like a national cancer registry, and uh, they survival basically, you know. So this is a typical Kaplan-Meier survival curve. You have an idea how people, so stage four colon cancer, not many people survive for many years, by five years, the survival is down to about 10%. Whereas stage one, in five years, the survival maybe is 85%. Uh, 
Uh, would anyone like to say what the numbers are below the axis? Okay, great, Sarah. Yeah, so Sarah says the number of people uh, still included in this study. And uh, I, think, I think that's a good definition. It's also called number at risk uh, for short. That is, you say at each time, say at four years, stage one, there were 3,000 people at risk, meaning they are still, uh, you know, there's data on them. And so you can, you can say something about what happened to them. And uh, so the numbers go down simply because uh, people are dying, right? That's the usual reason why the number at risk goes down. Uh, but the number at risk can also go down because you're losing people to follow up, that you don't have data on them beyond a certain time, and so you, uh, the numbers can go down. And that's why it's very important. Anytime you look at a paper uh, or you report your data, there must be a number at risk table below the graph. If there isn't, it's very hard to decide how much confidence to place in some numbers at the end. So that I see a clearer example of here. Uh, I don't know the cancer registry where people who lost the follow-up or not, but this is a paper. They studied uh, vitamin supplementation in smokers in Finland to see whether that reduced their risk of cancer. So there were 29,000 people recruited from 85 to 88, study ended at 92. Nobody was lost to follow-up. Being Scandinavia, they actually were able to keep track of everybody. Nobody was lost to follow up. And this is the data on prostate cancer incidence in that cohort. And the paper was focused on prostate cancer. So the first question to ask is, why are they looking at cumulative incidence instead of disease-free survival? You notice in the uh, previous one, it was survival. That, of course, it was living and dying. But here, they could have graphed disease-free survival, starting at 100% and going down. So why didn't they do that and instead report cumulative incidence? Uh, just to be very clear, the two, they give the same information. If you take uh, 100 minus uh, survival percent, you will get the cumulative incidence percent. So why are they reporting cumulative incidence? The reason is actually trivial. The reason it just has to do with how the graphs look. If you, because you notice here that in the worst group, the cumulative incidence was still under 2%. So if you graph this as a survival curve, everything would be between 100 and 98%. So all the curves would be stuck together. So in order to paint a clearer picture, you do uh, cumulative incidence. Okay, so the next question is, if you look at the data from four to seven years, they go down a lot. You see here that uh, the numbers are in the 6,700, but by seven years, they're down to 1,400. So why did that happen? Because nobody was lost to follow up. So why should the numbers go down even though uh, nobody was lost to follow up, this is not a trivial question, and it and it but it but it is very important to be clear about it. Um, so and that is, the study stopped in '92, but recruitment went on for four years. It took them four years to assemble their thirty thousand cohorts. So when the study stopped, some people had been in the study only for four years. So they didn't have data on them after four years. And some people would have been there for five years and they would have data on them for five years and so on. So the only people they would have come to seven years would be people who were recruited in 85. And that's the reason these numbers drop. So the point that I want to make here is that even if you have complete follow-up, no loss to follow-up whatsoever, these numbers will go down simply because recruitment takes place over time. 
And it's not only this study, same thing happens in observational cohorts. I think one of the residents uh, is uh, looking at post-transplant complications. And, and so uh, if she looks at time to complication as the outcome, that she, I'm sure, has complete data in all the kids who are transplanted at Columbia, but the time to complication data will be something in kids who were transplanted 10, 15 years ago, as opposed to kids who were transplanted last year or two years ago. So when she does her, if she does a kaplan meier curve, these numbers, numbers at, number at risk will go down with time. And that number has to be included in the report. Because so for instance, here, you can't just say, the entire, all the, the entire graph is useful because you have 30,000 people. No, for the last year, you don't actually have 30,000 people. You have maybe half that number. And in the very last couple of months, maybe you have a fraction of the number. So at that point, you have to make a judgment as to whether to trust some little blip here, like this curve, shoots up a little bit and this curve shoots up a little bit. Is that real? Or is it just happen with a small number of people? Not the 7,000 you started off with, but a much smaller number. So when you look at a kaplan meier curve, you may say, well, I'm gonna take these curves seriously up to so much time, so many years, not beyond that. And the p-value, that the Kaplan-Meier analysis calculates, takes that into account. It does not treat all the curves equally. It takes into account that the numbers change. So, so that's the point. And one more point I want to uh, make before getting into analyzing Kaplan-Meier data, and that is that after four years, the numbers go down because of the recruitment time. But the numbers also go down in the first four years. You can see in the first four years, even the worst group is below 1% prostate cancer incidence, cumulative incidence. So that means out of the 7,000 in each group, not even 70 develop prostate cancer. But these numbers drop by several hundred. So why should that happen? Reason is that this is a cancer study, not just prostate cancer study. So probably the biggest risk in these smokers in terms of cancer was lung cancer. And so quite a few would have developed lung cancer as well as possibly other cancers. And if they did, they would be dropped from the study. And that accounts for the initial 400. And it's also possible some of them died. So, you know, uh, older men, smokers, the, uh, you know, there would be mortality risk as well. So th this is called a competing risk situation. That is, you're primarily interested in the risk for prostate cancer, but you have to censor data when some competing risk comes around. That is, if they develop some other cancer or if they die, clearly they have to be dropped from the study. So that's, uh, that's the reason the numbers go down from more than 7,000, you know, down by four or 500 uh, in four years. Okay, with, uh, with that background, um, so one question that can be asked is, uh, why can't we do T-tests? on time to cancer. And the answer there is trivial. You can't do T-test because the vast majority did not develop cancer at all. So you don't have a value for time to cancer in those people. So you have to have some other way of analyzing. Um, now you can also, you could consider doing Wilcoxon or done uh, because the ones who didn't develop cancer at all you could just give some big number. As I told you before uh, last week, the non-parametric analyses, Wilcoxon and Dunn, 
work with ranks, not with actual numbers. So if you just gave everybody a million or something days to cancer, the ones who didn't develop cancer, that'll be okay. But the problem is that it doesn't deal with censoring. So if you don't have data on somebody after four years, you don't actually know that they didn't develop cancer for seven years. You don't know that. So when you have data censoring, you have to have a different approach. And that's what the Kaplan-Meier analysis does. The Kaplan-Meier test does it. So it has to extend the Wilcoxon to deal with censored data. I want to say a little bit about how the survival curve is calculated when you have sensory. Now, of course, CUKM, uh, the function we have, is going to do that for you. But you should know how the survival curve is calculated when you have sensory. So this is an example that I, uh, very simple, trivial example. Say you start with 10 people. And at time two, uh, there is an event. Somebody has an event. And so you're left with nine. And you can say percent survival is 90. Uh, time four, there is another event. Percent survival is 80. And time five, it goes down to 70, to 60, to 50. Right? So you can calculate, you calculate these very easily by saying 9 over 10, 8 over 10, 7 over 10, and so on. Right? But there is a more convoluted way to calculate it. And and that is this. You say at each time, you calculate the survival from the previous time. That is, you have eight over nine, eight over nine, and you multiply eight over nine by the survival at the previous time. Is you say survival at time four is 90 times eight over nine. And survival at time five is 80 times seven over eight. And then 70, and six over seven. Now, when you do this, you get the same number. So you might say, this is being silly. Why should I work with this and you know, do this convoluted thing to get the same number? And the, the reason is censoring. Suppose now you have some of these people are lost to follow up. They didn't have an event at those times, but they were simply lost. So that is indicated here by zero. So, so the time at time four, this subject was lost. They didn't have an event. And time eight, the subject was lost. So what happens now is that at time one, survival is 90. At the time four, survival remains at 90 because this person didn't have an event. They were just lost. And when you go to the next one, the person has an event. It is not correct to calculate the survival as seven over 10. Seven over 10 is wrong because this person didn't have an event and you don't know what happened to that person. So you take this convoluted approach. You say the survival at the previous time, 90 times seven over eight. And so the survival is 79. And then the next, time, time eight, no event, somebody is lost, so no change, no change in survival. And then at the final time, somebody has an event, and you don't say five out of 10, you say 79 times five over six, and you get the survival. So this is how Kaplan-Meier calculate the survival and then calculate the uh, P values and so on. So I, this is data that we did not, uh, um, you know, copy and store last time. So I would like you to go to this uh, tab in the data file that says Hep C survival data, and and just highlight these five columns. So A through E, and there is one line per subject, and the time is when something happened to that person. Now, what happened? 
status says what happened. So one means the event happened. Zero means the person was lost to follow up. And the, the, this, the, these are data I actually got off the web. I think these are real data on uh, treating hep C. This is long before the treatment became available. So this is just giving steroids to see whether survival is increased by steroids or not. And uh, so, so the treatment was prednisolone or control. And, uh, and so dead is similar. We're not going to be looking at it. It's just, you know, you, you can say yes or zero. And I think you can say that as well if you feel like. Okay, so this is a made up variable I made up so that I want to also show you that CUKM can handle more than two groups. Doesn't have to be just two groups. It could be like the examples we saw in the uh, colorectal cancer, there were four groups. And then likewise in the Finnish study, there were four groups. So you could do that. So I would like you to copy A through E to the, clip, to the clipboard. And then you need to do this first, HD equals CU read. Then you, uh, you can copy paste this if you like, but of course HCU read, you have to type. So you do HD equals CU read, and then you do an attach, which is necessary for CUKM. And then CUKM, this is the syntax. You say time, the time to event, and what is the event variable? and what is the treatment you're trying to compare. But you should have 88 observations. If you copied the columns correctly into the clipboard, you should have 88 observations of five variables. And in your own data, as I mentioned before, um, I'm sure ad nauseum, that uh, as soon as you do see you read, check that you have the right number of observations and variables. So, so you, when you run CUKM, it first gives you a summary table uh, that is in each, how many were in each group and how many events were there. So there were 32 events in this group, 22 events in this group. And it gives a p-value uh, for the Kaplan-Meier test. And, uh, and it also gives you a hazard ratio, which is like relative risk. So we did relative risk at the beginning of the, uh, the mini course. So, uh, so that's the hazard ratio. Uh, with confidence interval. And what is the hazard ratio? So what, what is the relationship to odd ratio or relative risk? So it turns out that I think we, this is sort of similar to what I showed you in the very first lecture. So you have placebo intervention total and uh, you know, how many died, what's the total? So with, the com with complete follow-up, that is no loss of censoring at all, then total hazard is defined as OT over NT and expected deaths in each row, null hypothesis and so on. And you can make, go through the calculations for the hazard ratio. You will end up hazard ratio equals relative risk. Okay, so the hazard ratio is uh, relative risk in a situation where you have incomplete data, where you have sensory. So that's the best way to understand hazard ratio. It is the same as relative risk, but uh, in a situation where you have um, sensory, data censoring or loss to follow up. So it extends relative risk to survival data with incomplete follow up. So I, so the little rant on the side, again, odds ratio not relevant here. The key assumption in analyzing sensor data whether Kaplan-Meier or Cox proportional hazards, that the censoring is non-informative. And it may not make sense uh, what I mean by non-informative. What, what it is saying is that censoring in any subject, maybe they moved away or whatever happened, it happens independent of which group the person belongs to. So it's easy to see why this is important. If a person was lost to follow up because they were doing poorly on whatever treatment they were getting, then dropping them is going to bias the results. It's going to make that treatment look better, right? In the extreme, imagine that some treatments that say the steroid is killing people 
and and people just realize they're doing very badly and they go off the steroid. So now the steroid was a failure in that subject, but you won't know this in this analysis because you just dropped them from the study. So, so the non-informative censoring is a, is a key assumption to the validity of Kaplan-Meier or Cox modeling. And you need to be comfortable that that is in fact the case. And so one thing that is done often, a couple of things that are done is one in a, in a, in a double blind study, randomized double blind study, they would compare the drop off rates in the different arms. So that would give you a clue as to whether your treatment may be having a role in people dropping off. So if the drop off rate is higher in the intervention arm compared to the placebo arm, then maybe you have a problem with there. And uh, another way that people do also is they look at the people who dropped out and compare them with the people who didn't drop out, whether any, there are any demographic differences, et cetera. Uh, okay, so if you did the CUKM, you should see this on the right side. This is the survival curve. And the curve is not very smooth because we don't have that many subjects. And so every event causes a little drop. You can say KM type equals CI. This is a kaplan meier type of CI. CI is for cumulative incidence. If you put that, then CUKM will give you cumulative incidence rather than uh, survival. So the plus signs on the curves uh, refer to sensory. So if somebody is lost to follow up, that's indicated by a plus. So again, you can, you can look at this and say, uh, is the sensory different in the two groups? Is there any difference in the pattern? And if you don't see any difference in the pattern, you feel more comfortable. And this is the number at risk that I talked about, that I said you must have any Kaplan, any Kaplan Maya curve in order to be taken seriously, should have number at risk at the bottom. So UKM provides that as well, and uh, the number at risk. UKM time status treat three. If you copy paste this, you will get, now this treat three is three treatments. Uh, there is prednis alone and, uh, and something called drug two. So then what CUKM does is it compares each pair of treatments, control versus drug two, control versus prednis alone, and drug two versus pregnancy alone. And then for each comparison, it gives you a key value, a hazard ratio. So, so you have that. And, and you will have three curves here, the, um, uh, the kaplan meier curves. And this has to do with, uh, uh, you know, multiple testing. You know, if you start looking at lots of different things, you're going to find something that is significant. And, uh, and that's, uh, you know, that's the point that uh, this cartoon is making. So you keep looking and you find out of 20 tests, one of them was significant at 0.05, which of course is to be expected just by chance. Uh, but then you try to publish it and say, I found significance. Uh, but of course you do it again and you don't see it because obviously it was a chance uh, finding. And so you, you spin that by saying you need more research. I, I want to show a little video that uh, that goes with that point. And uh, let me see, uh, I'll do that now pretty quickly. Since Fisher's day, p-values have been used as a convenient yardstick for success by many, including most scientific journals. Since they prefer to publish successes, and getting published is critical to career advancement, the temptation to massage and manipulate experimental data into a good p-value is enormous. There's even a name for it, p-hacking. P-hacking is when researchers consciously or unconsciously guide their data analysis to get the results that they want. And since 0.05 is kind of the, the bar for being able to publish and call something real and get all your grant money, it's usually guiding the results so that you arrive at that P of 0.05. How much p-hacking really goes on is hard to know. What may be more important is to remember what was originally intended by a p-value. 
The p-value was always meant to be a detective, not a judge. If you do an experiment and find a result that is statistically significant, that is telling you that is an interesting place to look and research and understand further what's going on. Not, don't study this anymore because the matter is settled. In a sense, a low p-value is an invitation to reproduce the experiment, to help validate the result. But that doesn't always happen. In fact, there are few career incentives for it. Journals and funders prefer novel research. There is no Nobel Prize for replication. Another solution to p-hacking and the overemphasis on p-values may simply be greater transparency. More and more, what people are doing is publishing their data. And so it's becoming harder and harder to lie with statistics because people will just probe and say, well, give me the set you analyzed and let me see how you got this result. I think I'm going to stop with this slide today. Uh, so going back to extending two by two analysis, you know, what we did today, we did one way, two way rep mess for categorical outcomes and we did logistic regression and we did Kaplan-Meier analysis. So what is left in this categorical variable analysis is what if you have both? Uh, you have multiple factors and you have time to case the sensor data. Then you need Cox proportional hazard modeling, which is what we will do um, next week and using CU Cox. And once we finish that, I will also spend some time on the web tool. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, people who are interested in uh, using our functions, uh, I hope find the web tool uh, valuable. And also I want to talk about matching, the different ways to match in a study. And I think it's good to sort of view them in some comprehensive way about matching. And that then leads to propensity matching. And so depending on time and interest, I will, uh, I will cover uh, propensity uh, matching as well next week. So, so that's the program. And uh, so, um, so I'm done.